When Ken Hildebrand is thrown from his quad bike in the remote Canadian wilderness, he's pinned to the frozen ground beneath half a ton of metal. I almost threw up just from the pain. Injured, alone, and exposed to all this savage region can throw at him, Ken must battle to stay alive. All he can do is hope that someone finds him before he either freezes to death or the predators closing in on him move in for the kill. My chances were very slim, very slim. Packing for a solo trip into the Canadian Rockies in the depths of winter. And he knows it pays to leave nothing to chance. Some guys on the uh, rescue squad now call me Mr. Gadget because they always thought that I carried too much. And they used to always say, well, if we need to go out on a rescue, we always want to be paired up with Ken because he never gets lost, he always knows where he's at and he can survive. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm going up to Bob Creek to collect some traps. But, uh, you know, I should be back in time, give or take uh, an hour or three. The survival expert regularly heads into the mountains alone and makes no firm plans about his return with his family and friends. Well, listen, if I don't show, uh, we'll do it when Lil's back, OK? Ken is a registered animal trapper. And this trip is to check up on beaver traps that he set the day before. We trap to keep a good, healthy population of animals. And beavers are a rodent. The goal is to try and keep beavers from overpopulating. Ken loves the great outdoors and nothing stops him from enjoying this vast wilderness, not even his disabled leg. I had polio. I had over 20 operations when I was a child. I mean, I was never supposed to walk. I threw the braces away and everything else, and I said, I'm going to walk. I'm going to do whatever normal people do. Getting around this remote region is a real challenge. And Ken's trusty steed is his four-wheel quad bike. The terrain is very rugged. The country is very mountainous. The uh, hills are very, very steep. And there are, are a lot of places on my trap line that people even that are good, good quarters, they wouldn't even tackle. Today's ride is even more dangerous. Ken's bike is carrying a lot of extra weight. My uh, quad, uh, without any fuel in it, that weighs 600 pounds. The beavers, uh, 35 and 50 pounds a piece. Then the three gallons of gas, yeah, pretty close to 1,000 pounds. A small pickup truck would probably weigh that. The temperature drops below zero and the wind picks up, so Ken calls it a day. The wind was blowing at least 80 kilometers an hour. It was stuff blowing in my face as I was trying to drive. It was blowing up small rocks. All of a sudden, I felt this sharp pain in the eye, and, and I blinked, and I felt 
like a piece of grass in my eye. And the second I let go of my handlebars, I grabbed a hold of this piece of grass. And the bike started going up and over. I was on the way down, and I could feel the bike was following me over. It's just that there was nothing I could do. It felt to me like I was fast enough that uh, I was getting out of the way, but then, wham, it was so fast. It just knocked me right face first into the dirt. And then I felt this excruciating pain in my leg. I could feel my foot. I could feel my ankle just totally dislocating and the bones were breaking. I almost threw up just from the pain. The steel rack ran me in the, in the smaller part of the back and drove me down and knocked the wind out of me. The pain was from my ankle and uh, in the calf of my leg. I couldn't push and lift myself enough to, to move the bike. No matter how I tried to move my legs, I couldn't. The heavily laden quad has pinned Ken to the ground in the middle of nowhere. As a paramedic with the local rescue unit, Ken's first instinct is to try to assess the severity of his injuries. I took my pulse. My pulse was at 160. It was bounding. I could feel, you know, so my blood pressure must have been up high because I could really feel my pulse. My skin was pale. Uh, if I pinched it, it was slow to come back to normal. It took uh, five seconds for my color to go back in my finger, so I knew that I was in shock. Pain and the anxiety was causing me to make my heart rate go up. So I knew I had to slow myself down so that I could rationalize, I could think properly. Ken learned how to deal with pain as a child, fighting polio. I kind of mentally block it out. It's amazing how much pain I can actually block out. Ken cannot reach his legs, which took the full impact of the crash. And he can only imagine the kind of damage that's been done. My first assumption was that, yes, I dislocated my ankle for sure, possibly crushed it. I thought that maybe I had uh, done a lot of damage to my right knee because it hurt like hell. My polio leg is not very big. I can actually put my hand around it like this. When it smashed down into that ground, I thought for sure that knee was done. The weight of Ken's quad bike and survival gear exerts enormous pressure on his injured legs, causing excruciating pain. It crushes his good right leg against his weaker polio leg, cutting off the circulation from his calf to his foot. Ken knows that to avoid permanent damage, he needs to act fast. My first reaction was, I need to get out from underneath the quad, uh, even if I've broken my leg. So I looked around and tried to see if there's any sticks or anything I could grab. All of Ken's gear is still strapped to the quad. <laughs> Only his ax has fallen clear during the crash but it's tantalizingly just out of reach. Ken's survival instinct kicks in. I always carry this fire starter around my neck and a compass on a string. Getting his hands on the ax could mean the difference between life and death. <laughs> to Ken, the axe is his only means of escape.
took me several tries or more to finally catch the butt of the axe handle. I thought right away, well, maybe I can use my axe as a leverage to push the quad off of me. But trapped face down, it's impossible for Ken to get enough leverage on the axe handle to lift the quad. Now I think, OK, I, I'm stuck here. I'm, I'm actually trapped. But when you're in that uh, situation, you've got to try something. And if that don't work, you've got to try something else. I was thinking, well, if I can reduce the weight on the quad, maybe I'll have a better chance of getting out from underneath it. But every strike causes agonizing pain to Ken's injured body as he tries to knock the heavy gear from the quad. And then I thought, if I can perhaps maybe pile a beaver up, stick the ax in there on the corner of the rack. With the beavers under his arms, Ken's hoping the extra height will make a difference. It seems to be working. The quad moves a fraction of an inch. It felt so good. I mean, it, it still hurt like hell. And it felt like the bones were, were broken, but at least that steady, constant pressure was relieved. Fueled by adrenaline, Ken decides it's time for a make or break effort to free himself. I've just broken my best chance of getting out of here, so what am I going to do now? Ken is now completely trapped in this Canadian wilderness. He has to come up with another escape plan if he's going to survive. Now I thought, OK, the axe is broke. The handle's not as long. Perhaps now I can take and I can get underneath there and chop and hack away some of the ground. If Ken can loosen the soil beneath him, he might be able to work himself free. But weighed down by his quad and the equipment, it's a near impossible task. You, you try chopping like this here in a little space, it's, it's, a, it's, the, it's a challenge. <laughs> because I couldn't get underneath my leg. I kept trying to get underneath it, but every time I tried to, to chop to get underneath it, I'd either hit the ground and the ax would ricochet into my leg, or I would just hit my leg. Despite the pain, Ken simply refuses to surrender and accept his fate. When you're caught in a survival situation like that, your attitude has so much to do with it. It's very easy to give up, to think that, oh, it's all despair, there's no hope. Uh, as long as you don't let those things get in your way and you stop and rationalize, it's surprising how many little things that you can do. I continued trying to figure out and evaluate some way that I could move that quad so that I could get one leg free. If I could get just one leg free, I can get out from underneath this thing. Despite his ingenuity and effort, Ken begins to realize he may have to spend the night alone in the freezing Alberta mountains.
all your nerves at that point in time is raw. Your mind is going through a million things, like how long is this going to last? I tried every which way possible and thought of what if I could do this or if I could get that or... <laughs> After five hours, I had exhausted all my options. Darkness is closing in. The Rockies at night are deadly, especially in winter when the temperatures can plummet to 20 below. Freezing cold winds rush down off the mountains, and these howling gusts play tricks with Ken's mind. I hear something and I stop. Now, am I really hearing that or am I not hearing that? In fact, I was. Incredibly, Ken has crashed his quad just half a mile away from a farmer's house. If somebody would just hear his cries, his ordeal would be over. When I first heard the dogs, it gave me a little bit of spark of hope. Well, maybe I won't have to spend the night after all. Help! Ken's prepared for every eventuality. He even carries a whistle around his neck which he uses to attract attention. The dogs, of course, because they have so much better hearing than a human, they could hear me. <laughs> but his distress calls are drowned out by the high winds and go unheard by human ear. Over here! I heard him going in and out of the house a few times. <laughs> Over here! Help was so, so close, but yet so far away. It's another devastating blow for Ken. And to make matters even worse, all of the gear and supplies that he's bought that could keep him alive are tied to his bike, completely out of reach. What I had on my quad, I could have survived for a month, no problem. I had uh, water, I had a uh, hot coffee in it. My first aid kit, of course, and a sleeping bag that's good for 40 below. Without all this life-saving equipment, Ken faces the ultimate test of his survival skills. The temperature is already 11 below, and with the wind chill, it feels even colder. He might die of hypothermia if he doesn't think fast. I knew that the wind, the cold, could kill me easily in a matter of probably half an hour or less if I went to sleep. Freezing conditions take their toll. Ken knows that his violent shivering could be the first sign that hypothermia has set in. And it can only get worse from here. Once you stop shivering, you are in severe hypothermia. And your shock can be irreversible. People that go into hypothermia get this euphoria of being warm. They stop shivering, they go to sleep, and, and, and then they, they die. During uh, my 15 years on rescue, I have probably seen three or four people that were in the situation that I was in, and none of them survived. So I forced myself to stay awake. And even when I got to the point where I couldn't shiver properly, I would force myself deliberately, force myself to move to simulate uh, shivering. I knew I needed to keep my body heat from going into the ground. 
If Ken skins one of the dead beavers, he might be able to slide its fur underneath his body for insulation. But there's a danger the smell might also attract predators. And with his axe broken, he's powerless to fight them off. I know the possibilities of cougars or any predator coming around is greater every uh, hour that I stay there. Had I been attacked by a cougar, my chances would have been zero. Ken knows without skinning the animal, he will die. There's little chance of rescue soon. His family aren't expecting him home for days, and even his dinner plans were tentative. But uh, listen, if I don't show, uh, we'll come when Lil's back. Ken decides the rewards of skinning the beaver outweigh the risk of attracting predators. I put the hide side down and the fur side up, so that made my stomach a lot warmer. The temperatures continue to drop, and it's another eight hours until sunrise. The beaver's pelt gives him some temporary relief, but at a cost. The smell of fresh carcass could be carried for miles around, with predators soon picking up on the scent. Ken's greatest concern is dehydration. It's been 12 hours since his accident, and he hasn't been able to drink any fluid. I had already been sweating for quite a bit because of the pain. Number two, the exertion I was using trying to move this quad. His body is losing water rapidly, and if he's unable to replace it, he will die. Part of the problem with hypothermia is your, your fluid levels. Because your blood is drawn to your vital organs and that, you need that fluid. Oh. I had the stuff on my quad, but I couldn't reach it. Oh. I had an extra gallon of water, a thermos full of coffee. I knew that I needed to get some kind of moisture somehow, somewhere. Ken carries a roll of plastic flagging tape to mark out the areas where he's laid his traps. Now he has an idea that he can use it to save his life. If I can get frost on the ribbon, I can run it through my teeth. And I can get the moisture from the frost. I don't know how much moisture I got from it, but it was enough to keep the inside of my mouth a little bit moist at times. But it brings him little relief. He's not eaten for 20 hours, and his body is weakening with every minute in these severe conditions. I knew I needed something for strength. I decided I was going to try and eat some beaver. It was uh, like meat that's crystallized, partly frozen. So that probably in itself probably helped me to kind of gnaw it and get it down. But it, it wasn't the pleasantest thing that I've eaten. All of a sudden, I just felt sick to my stomach, and it came back up. So I thought, well, this isn't good. I'm losing more bodily fluids. Every decision Ken makes now could mean the difference between life and death.
the thing that played the most on my mind was the fear. I didn't want somebody in my family to have the anguish of finding me and, you know, partially ate by an animal or something. You know, who knows what can happen once you, when, once you pass away. After 15 hours of darkness, Ken's survival knowledge and sheer strength of will have seen him through the night, crushed under his quad bike in freezing temperatures. Suddenly, the early morning silence is broken by a welcome sound. I'm taking the rescue crew is finally coming. It's about damn time I'm gonna give them guys hell. No. And uh, it flew off in the distance. Once again, Ken's chances of rescue are just out of reach. Desperate for help, he tries to alert the farmer again. The farmhouse is only half a mile away, but Ken's desperate cries go unheard. I was just exhausting every possibility uh, that I could try and use. One defeat after another. At that point in day two, I wasn't really sure how long I'd be able to survive. Ken's second day passes slowly, with his survival kit just out of reach, and the chance of rescue so frustratingly close. All he can do is lie and wait, and get what moisture he can. He's still covered in the scent of fresh meat, and the dangers of night threaten again. I thought that I heard something move. And I seen a couple of coyotes off on the right. Ken's biggest fear has been realized. The scent of the skinned beaver has attracted some unwelcome visitors. Even from a distance, the coyotes can see that Ken is trapped and can't move. Coyotes can be unpredictable. It's not the first time that they have attacked humans. When I heard uh, coyotes uh, messing around, I thought there was a possibility that they might uh, get more aggressive. I got a couple of rocks, and I've got the broken axe handle laying there.
I thought, I, you know, how long that would last, who knows? Ken has already been trapped for over 30 hours. His survival training has kept him alive, but the paramedic realizes that parts of his body are already dying. The constant pressure of the quad's wheel and the swelling in his right leg is causing serious nerve and tissue damage. Ken knows that even if he is found now, his good leg might not survive. During the night, it got to a point where it was like, your foot goes to sleep and you get all those needles and pins going through it. I figured, well, my foot is beyond saving now, for sure. The hopelessness of his situation starts to take its toll. We just finished celebrating my, my granddaughter's birthday. I was thinking about that quite a bit because uh, my uh, daughter had videoed me dancing with my grandkids. That's probably the last time I'll dance with them. Are we missing out? Ken draws strength from the battles he won as a young boy. You know, I've been through worse than that. I mean, I was never supposed to walk. I had 20 operations when I was a kid, and I threw the braces away. And that much of a challenge that I can't uh, overcome that. To thee, my savior, God, to thee. It works wonders for your morale if you sing. It also, if there was something coming close, they knew that I was human. And perhaps they might stay a little further away before they found out, you know, what kind of circumstance I was actually in. How great thou art. How great thou art. How great thou art. Just before daylight, they, they came back. The coyotes have returned. And this time, they changed their tactics, closing in on Ken from behind. Unable to see them, Ken can only imagine their next attack. You can hear them scratching, and you can you know quick pitter-patters of feet. And then you hear a little yap. And then you can hear some more feet, so you don't know whether they're 200 yards away or whether they're right behind you. They were definitely excited, and they were getting each other excited. As the coyotes move in for the kill, they discover one of the dead beavers that fell off the quad during the crash. It sounded just like they were fighting over it. They sounded like they were a lot closer. Now, the coyotes have a taste for blood, and Ken fears he is next on the menu. What's next? Are they gonna get more aggressive? The frenzy of noise seems to attract the attention of the dogs in the nearby farmhouse. But once again, high winds muffle the noise from human ears. Perhaps if he would have let one of his dogs go, maybe they had it, would have come to me. The 
the noise seems to scare off the coyotes for now. As day breaks, Ken has been trapped for nearly 40 hours. The chance of rescue remains so close, yet so far away. Every time that I could hear the sound of the dogs barking or I could hear the farmer opening the door and I would blow the whistle. <laughs> Nothing would happen. It was very frustrating, damn frustrating to What's going on? Why cannot something come my way for a change? Why can't my luck change? I'm the type of guy that, you know, like uh, I've always been very independent and uh, this is the first time I found myself in a situation where I couldn't rely on myself to get myself out of it. Ken's friends and family still have no idea he's missing and no rescue operation has been launched. You know, I was down, definitely I was down. As a paramedic, Ken knows his body is rapidly deteriorating. I knew that shock was probably getting worse. My core body temperature was definitely dropping. My fuel intake was zero. It was more concentrated on trying not to, to fade off and go to sleep. I knew that uh, if I was going to survive at all, I had to stay awake. Just before dark again, the coyotes came back and there was a few more. I was so intent and focused on what these coyotes might be doing. One can only imagine and think because you can't see them, right? It's Ken's third night trapped under the quad. Exposed, dehydrated and close to death. And this time, the coyotes have returned to hunt as a pack. They're, uh, well versed at uh, their attack tactics. They would have tried definitely for my face or my throat because that was uh, the most uh, exposed. If you're swinging one way, they would try to grab you from the back. This pack have already tasted fresh meat and they're craving for more. If I couldn't scare them off with the whistle and hollering, my chances were very slim, very slim. Ken's outburst is just enough to fend off the coyotes. But if he has to spend another night out there, they'll be back and he may not have the strength to fight them off for much longer. For the full four days I never slept, I consciously made sure that I kept myself awake because I know from experience the wind, the cold could kill me easily. My body was telling me it was a downward slide. My mental alertness wasn't there, my coordination wasn't as good as it could have been. So I knew all those things were telling me that my body is shutting down more all the time. For sure.
My family was my primary focus. I can deal with whatever comes along. It's how can they deal with it? You know, how will it affect them? I thought that if I didn't make it, maybe while I still got my faculties together and I'm still able to write a message, I should write a message to them, just in case. Well, I uh, told him I was sorry. And I loved him. I took my glasses off and I laid them in front of me and I thought that, well, maybe, you know, just maybe I, I could get a little bit of rest. Finally, I actually uh, close my eyes. On the fourth day of battling pain and fear, of forcing himself to stay awake, to fend off dangerous coyotes and hypothermia, Ken finally lets go. That morning was a nice day for a walk, and I decided to take my dog to a particular area to visit friends. And looking at the beautiful hills and the mountains in the background, I changed my plans, went to another area, and found an area I'd never been before. Why did I change my mind? I have no idea. Let's go. Search and rescue expert Roy Davidson seems to be being led by fate to a certain point in the mountains. I had no intention of being in that area whatsoever. I changed my plans five times to end up where I was. When I got down into the bottom of the valley, that's where I changed my mind again. Let's go, come on, come on. But I just looked over and I saw the quad. And it looked like something, somebody underneath it. Oscar, come on. I'm on the search and rescue, and about a year earlier, we'd had a search. We'd been looking for a, a missing hunter on a quad. We found this fellow, and he was underneath the quad, and he was dead. Oscar, 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 Oscar. It was exactly the same scene. I figured there was probably somebody pinned under there that was probably dead. Hello? I heard something, and is my mind playing tricks on me, or is this real? Are you all right? Did I go to sleep? Am I dreaming, or? I thought I was seeing things. I thought I was hallucinating. I said, oh boy, you know, this is getting really severe. Is it, is it real? What's your name? Ken Hill, I felt blessed, I felt lucky to be alive. I don't have to say goodbye to my family. The relief of the, like when they lifted the quad off of me, it was fantastic, you know, I just can't describe how great it felt, but it was short-lived. Come on. I tried to move my legs, and then I realized that I couldn't move my legs. When he first told me that he'd been there for four days and three nights, I didn't believe it. He was very calm. He was very businesslike. He knew what he had to do. He thought his legs, or at least one leg, was broken. What were you doing out here? That was probably a place where the quad wheel was sitting on his leg, 
and the flesh was frozen. I'm just gonna put this on. You've done that before. I knew that uh, for two days I didn't go to the bathroom anymore. I knew that, you know, I could have liver damage, I could have kidney damage. I think the reason that Ken survived is he's tough. He's one tough dude. Roy has to get Ken to hospital as soon as possible. I tried to be as careful as possible driving out of there. It was pretty rough. There was no road. It was just up the, the bottom of the valley. And his leg was starting to hurt him. It was probably hitting the bumps and stuff where I felt circulation going into parts of my legs and that, that I could actually feel. And, and it's, it's ironically that the pain actually felt good. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. It just, I wasn't down, but I wasn't, you know, jumping for joy like you think a person might because I knew I was still alive, but I, I knew I had a ways to go yet before I was out of the woods. How far, I wasn't sure. And I knew I wouldn't know until I was in the hospital. Surgeons fought to save Ken's right leg, but eventually they had to amputate, leaving him with a prosthetic limb and his weaker polio leg. But with the same determination that he had as a child, Ken is walking again. I had no doubt in my mind that I wasn't going to walk again. I'm going to walk. It's not just you that has to survive. It's your whole family that has to deal with the issues that come up. And if you love each other, you'll make it through.